I uh, thank you very much to to Raymond and ACSS for inviting me to participate in the program today. It has been an honor to to do so uh, over the years to have an opportunity to speak on different topics. And I particularly like when I visit a country and someone comes up to me and says, "Oh, I remember when you spoke to our group at the ACSS program," and it makes the world feel like a, a smaller place when you see familiar faces where, where you go. And I know by the end of three weeks together, you all will have forged a very strong network together and, and have those experiences as you go from, from one place to another as, as well. I've been thinking about the topic of leadership and change quite a bit, uh, both from the perspectives, as Michelle mentioned, as a civilian within our Department of Defense where I have been working for almost 25 years now and have had a chance to see such a variety of leadership styles, uh, military leadership, civilian leadership, strategic leadership, transformational leadership, and I'll talk about some of those, those terms as, as I move forward in this presentation. So I've had the benefit of, of seeing a lot of different leadership examples along the way and then these past two years, I've been here on campus at National War College working with military and civilian students who are midway through their, their careers and are learning how to develop national security strategy. And we spend a lot of time working on case studies where we look at strategic leaders and debate how they operated in, in particular cases. And one of my students at one point said, what is the difference between leading strategically and strategic leadership. Are they the same thing or are those two different things? And that provoked a discussion in our class that lasted for uh, weeks. And uh, this year I introduced the question to a different class of students and we had that conversation for a long period of time. And the results of that conversation are also informing what I will be sharing with you today, this idea that that there is a, a broad set of leading strategically skills that, that anyone and everyone can practice in their positions in whatever opportunities they face in life. And then there's something different that is strategic leadership that is perhaps more positional. And then finally, the idea of transformational leadership, which is really about changing uh, culture or society or, or people uh, in ways that, that can be associated with formal leadership or, or informal leadership. So with that as a preview, could I have the next slide, please? Oh, I have the slide. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if I go forward or backward. All right. Very good. So th this is, uh, I'll, I'll use this um, graphic in the course of the discussion to illustrate this idea that I was just mentioning, that you have different types of foundational leadership. Are we okay with the slides? One of the slides. Oh, that's the English, the French one is not, is not happening. No. I, I think they are all in English because they, they were only provided um, by me yesterday, so there wasn't time to translate. So sadly, you all have to look in uh, English, but you have the translation from the, from the interpreters. So the, as I, I was beginning to mention, this, this idea that there are foundational leadership attributes that are accessible to anyone who wishes to, to practice them and, and hone them. Uh, but they feed in turn two different concepts. One is the concept of strategic leadership, uh, which is really a person typically in a position that has been elected or appointed and by virtue of that position has an impact on a large institution or at the national level or even international level. That, that's the way that I'll use strategic leadership in, in my discussion today. In contrast, you have the idea of transformational leadership, which really has to do with the change of society, of, of people, of cultures. Uh, and, and that can be, that can happen from uh, positions 
of leadership or from external to positions of formal leadership. And you have some leaders, the, the intersection of the two is showing that you have some people who are in strategic leadership positions who have the opportunity and practice transformational leadership, but that's not all of them. And then you have many transformational leaders who may come from civil society or, or somewhere outside of a formal position, and they have a tremendous impact uh, for, for change and for leadership. So that's, that's the general idea, and I'll try to illustrate it in more detail in the next uh, few slides. So the, the idea of general leadership, I think you have tackled it a bit yesterday, but I wanted to, to mention these seven qualities that my students and I came up with to describe what does it mean to be leading strategically, or you could even say what does it mean to be leading well. And these were some of the ideas that we had, and I was interested to see if we were, we were thinking in a particularly American context or what, whether this is really a, a broader um, international or, or global context. And so I, I looked, you know, the, the, some of the wisdom of Africa is expressed in Proverbs, and I looked for Proverbs to see if there was an alignment between some of these ideas. And I, I think there is a strong alignment, but I think it's something we can discuss further as we go forward. I'll just uh, pick a few of these ideas. One of them, uh, this, the third one on the list, is the idea of taking care of the people that you're leading this idea of servant leadership that has become very, very popular. And there is an excellent proverb uh, from Tanzania, allegedly, that says, don't forget what it is to be a sailor when you become the captain. I think that embodies the essence of, of looking after people and understanding where, where you come from. Another example is the idea of robust communications and two-way communications. And the, an associated proverb with that is the idea of he who dictates separates himself from others. So the, the need to, to be listening as much as you are uh, projecting or, or directing, I think, is, is embodied in leading well, leading strategically. I think it can all be summed up by the idea at the bottom, he who thinks he is leading and has no one following is taking a walk. And I think that is really, the, at the end of the day, that's, that's the test. If you are a leader, do you have people who are following behind you? And are they following behind you because they believe in, in the path that you are laying out? Or are they following behind you because they have no other choice? So I think that, that is some of the, the essence of just general good leadership. Moving from there, I want to talk a little bit about strategic leadership in a bit more detail. So I was introducing this in the idea that uh, strategic leaders are, are maybe ones that are more of top-down in the sense that they are in positions of significant responsibility. They have, you know, potentially competed and, and risen to those levels, or they've been elected, or they've been appointed. This could be uh, true heads of state or examples of strategic leaders, um, ministers, or uh, heads of departments, heads of services, all of those I include in the kind of concept of strategic, strategic leaders. Strategic leaders have the challenge that I show in the first bullet of a broad scale of responsibility, and they may have to bring together different elements, some of whom are under their direct control, but some of whom they only influence. And so they have to, to create some kind of coherence out of this mixture uh, of followers, some they may be able to tell, you know, here, here's what I want you to do, and the others have to be persuaded. So that, to me, is a hallmark of a, a strategic leader. Another example is the idea of taking initiative and accepting risk. So that that's something that, that can happen for any leader in any position, but a strategic leader is taking risks at a significant level on a significant scale potentially even at a national scale. So that's one of the, the attributes I would associate with a strategic, <coughs> strategic leader. And then moving, this is where I want to spend the most time, and I'll, I'll move into some examples in just a second. But this, this idea of transformational leadership 
in the way that I'm framing it, transformational leadership could be top down, but it could also be bottom up, or it could come from the middle, or it could come from the side. The transformational leadership can, can manifest from many different directions because it's really mostly about a leader whose, whose personality and whose ethos inspire others and who see the need for change in, in the status quo. And that's why a lot of times you see transformational leaders coming from outside of a system. They may, they may not be the same as your strategic leaders who are, who are in typically governmental positions, but the, the need for change could be uh, coming from inside, but it could very well be coming from, from outside as well. And transformational leaders uh, require the quality of persistence because often they're facing tremendous adversity and over a sustained period of time with respect to the, the vision that they lay out. So with those in a generic sense, what I'd like to do is give some examples. I have uh, examples, I've got six US examples that I'll put up all on the, the same slide, and then six African examples. And my, my intent in doing this is to inspire a discussion on, you know, are these transformational leaders? Would you agree with, with those depicted and, and why, or why not as the case may be? So I'll start with my U.S. transformational leader examples. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, two of the ones that I've selected are, are former presidents, uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And I've included them because they were post-conflict leaders who really brought the, the nation together in a unique way. They were in a strategic leader position in that they were elected to their office, but then they led a transformation of the United States at a, in terms of people and culture and society. And so that's why I've included those two on as, as transformational leaders in addition to strategic leaders. The other individuals are maybe less well well known internationally, although I know some of them will be, but I included on here Eleanor Roosevelt, Cesar Chavez, and Martin Luther King Jr., all of who were advocates for sociocultural change in the United States and faced different levels of adversity in their advocacy around the issue of human rights. And they, they each had a different focus, uh, whether it was for women, whether it was for people of color, uh, for for the poor, for my, migrant and farm workers, in the case of Cesar Chavez, but these these were all transformational leaders who who had a vision. They had followers. They faced adversity, and and they persisted over a long period of time. the The last pair is it has a different character altogether. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates, and this is a different model of transformational leadership, where you see a very successful a uh, private sector leader with a revolution in, in the technology industry, then shift focus to transformation in the world more broadly and using billions of dollars of personal resources and then uh, securing additional resources from other sources to, to create a $50 billion endowment uh, that is being used to tackle issues related to poverty and, and disease or around the world. So a very, very different type of transformational leadership, but, but I think that's an important example as, as well. So then shifting to, the, to several African transformational leaders, the top three leaders on, on the slide, I consider to be strategic leaders because they were elected into their positions as heads of state in South Africa, obviously with President Mandela, Liberia for President Johnson Sirleaf, and Rwanda for President Kagame. But all three of them came into very difficult circumstances following internal conflict, civil war, and even genocide, and have worked to rebuild the social structures and the, the cultural structures in, in their countries. And for those reasons, I, I believe them to be both strategic leaders and, and transformational leaders. The three below are civil society actors, and you'll recognize Wangari Mathai, 
uh, the environmental activist uh, from Kenya and political activist, uh, the first Nobel Prize winner, uh, first African woman Nobel Prize winner, so very, very significant transformational leader in, in my evaluation. The next one is Tony Alemalu uh, from Nigeria, the, the billionaire who has been responsible for creating pan-African banking structures and has since moved into philanthropy in a significant way, private sector related philanthropy, and is creating the, the next generations of entrepreneurs, uh, not simply in, in Nigeria, but with, with programming on a continental scale. So sparking entrepreneurial change, transformational change. The final one is Trevor Noah from South Africa. Uh, he's a, a social and political commentator. He is a comedian. He is a television star uh, on a global basis at, at, at this point. Uh, he's also working on efforts to end domestic violence, to contribute to education and, and diversity initiatives, again, um, in, in Africa, in the United States, and beyond. He, he was on Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential global leaders in, in 2018. So it's an unusual choice, I know, but I, I wanted to include it because I think we have to open the aperture as we think about uh, transformational leadership. What I want to do uh, additionally is talk about a uh, U.S. case study. I know one of the, the readings, the one from the Yungozi Institute, and I probably mispronounced that, uh, had nine different African case studies that I thought were very powerful case studies looking at transformation in different countries in different situations. And I wanted to add a tenth uh, for consideration, a, a U.S. case study. And I'll just briefly touch on some pieces of this. What, what I'm highlighting here uh, is a combined case study. The first is looking at the campaign for the right of women to vote in the United States. And then the second is the campaign for women to participate in military service in the United States. And there are a couple of common themes in these. I was inspired to do this because we are at the 100th anniversary in the United States uh, for the constitutional amendment that allowed women to vote. So it's been 100 years since, since that uh, passed. But when you look at the, the history of the issue, it took about 70 years to go from the initial convention at Seneca Falls, where a group of women came together to discuss the fact that they didn't have the right to vote and, and that that needed to be changed. It, it took 70 years um, before the, the amendment was introduced. And I have a picture of Susan B. Anthony, who was one of many, many transformational leaders who, who were involved. And you couldn't put a picture of all of them. So she's, she's a stand-in for a broader group. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it, so 70 years to get to the point of the states having ratified the amendment and, and women being able to vote. And then e even at that point, women of color were not able to vote. And there were additional struggles in the civil rights era throughout the 1960s before the ability to, to vote was more broadly accepted across the United States uh, to include pe people of color as, as well as women. And I wanted to show the, the tally. So in 2019, so this is 170 years later, you can see where, where we are. Today we have 127 members of Congress, so these are representatives or senators uh, who, who are women, and that's about a little under 25%, so about one-fourth of the, the total uh, that you find seated in Congress today are, are women. And of course, the Speaker of the House is a woman, uh, Representative Nancy Pelosi. So I, I wanted to show this in part because it takes a long time to affect change, although there are tipping points with respect to the surrounding culture and with respect to, to individual leaders. The other, just briefly to touch on women in military service, there, there's a long history here as well. Uh, women have been participating in every conflict beginning in the Revolutionary War, where you had a handful who disguise themselves as men in order to participate in combat operations against yeah. the, the British at the time. 
And you also had women serving as nurses, which was much more common through the Revolutionary War, through the Civil War. Uh, women were, were only accepted uh, when, when the need was great. So in both world wars, women were uh, enabled to participate in the service, but then they were rejected as soon as the, the conflicts were over um, and, and not afforded veteran status or, or any other um, benefits for having served. So that changed in 1948. Uh, a law said that women would be allowed to, to serve in a regular way and I wanted to, to focus on really the length of time that's elapsed since 1948, the, the end of World War II. We've been uh, looking at the, the 75th anniversary of, of D-Day in, in the last week or so. So that's also fresh on our minds here. But it has taken a, a long period of time for women to very gradually be accepted in, in military service in the United States and I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the pipeline. So the pipeline for recruiting talent into the services. In 1976, that was the first time that West Point, uh, the U.S. Military Academy, accepted women cadets uh, into the, the service. And there was just a handful at that, that period of time. That was about the same time where the woman who's depicted in the second picture General Ann Dunwoody started her career. She didn't go to West Point, but she was commissioned into the Army. And she was the first four-star general uh, And in 2008 is when she was appointed into, into her position. So it, it has been a, a pretty slow pace. Um, there have been a lot of barriers, both in terms of within the, the military services, but also the broader culture <gasps> when it comes to the, the role of women in the services, and, and especially as you get to discussions about women in, in combat roles. So the, there was a change in, in law and associated changes in policies uh, beginning in 2016, where restrictions on women in serving in combat positions were eliminated. And so since then, you have started to see as women moving into those positions. Some of you may have seen the news that we have had now about a dozen women who have successfully completed the Ranger training. So some of the most arduous physical training uh, has been successfully completed by women meeting gender neutral standards that's has been part of the process where standards have to be upheld in terms of physical requirements and and women have been able to to meet those but i would just um, round out this case study discussion saying that that women represent about 16 percent of the total force today in the united states so it it is uh very much the, the minority still, even though they have made uh, tremendous strides along the way. We've had our first female combatant commander, so a four-star combatant commander responsible for operations uh, for North America, Canada, Mexico, including Homeland, Homeland Defense. And so that was a significant development as well. I thought a few of the conclusions from the, from the reading were applicable in talking about this case study as well. That transformational leadership is an intensely political process and requires mobilizing people and resources for the long haul. It's required to build coalitions and to account for, for spoilers or changes that, that will adversely impact the, the, the path that, that you are taking. But leaders have to be able to sense and understand the environment and when, when there are opportunities, when the environment is ripe for, for making changes. So in, in conclusion, what, what I would like to say is um, everyone can hone their leadership skills, that rectangular box at, at the bottom where you can lead strategically from whatever position you are in. And some of us in, in this room, uh, emerging leaders, emerged leaders, will have those opportunities for strategic leadership in the future. And, and that's contingent on hard work, but it's also contingent on the right circumstances and a certain element of luck, you know, for people to, to get lined up into those very, very um, strategic and senior level positions. But transformational leadership, I think, is something that is also open to all of us from the perspective of that doesn't have to be a, a top-down 
kind of arrangement. It trans transformation of, of culture, of institutions can happen from many different directions. And I, I am reminded of Gandhi uh, when he talked about being, being the change that you want to see, he said in the, in the world, but I think it's true in uh, less spectacular settings than at a global scale as well, that, that being the change, being a transformational leader, inspiring others to, to your vision is something that's available and accessible to anybody who, who chooses that path. And with that, I'll, I'll look forward to discussion and questions. Thank you.